The Wall Street Journal. Ladies and gentlemen, in the wee hours of the morning pre-dawn, the Senate passed the $95 billion Ukraine-Israel aid package, sending it to the House in, uh, you know, I, 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 the way I described it early in the morning is that while we were sleeping, the Senate took a blade and pressed it firmly against the back of the American people and then just applied pressure. But I think it's unfair because that would imply the Senate was on your side at any point. So I guess the easier way to, 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 to explain it is you were walking down a peaceful uh, street with flowers abound when a member of the Senate showed up and said, I'm going to take all your money and give it to Ukraine and then pulled the knife out. So it wasn't that you were being betrayed. It's that they were stealing from you in plain view. So here we go. 70 to 29 marked a victory for proponents of the muscular role in uh, for the U.S. in foreign affairs for the moment, elbowing aside isolationist forces in Congress. I love isolationist, they say. Me? Let me tell you guys, I'm not an isolationist. I think we should spend as much money as we can, every single penny that we can on every country on the planet, every single one, you name a country, bang, money, just make it rain. And what I said was all the money we can. And all the money we can is all the money we have left over after our roads are fixed, our schools are fixed or abolished, our, our borders are secure, health care is solved, the, the, the working is, class have places to live. With, maybe once we solve all those problems, we can then say, we're so wealthy, let's donate Maybe, but else. with fiat, we can print infinite. That's the problem. There will never be, all we but, can can always be more in the stupid system we've got set up. And I hear what you're saying, and, and that's, that's 70, I would say 75% correct, but I would add, when they mass print money or when they issue loans creating money upon the issuance of debt, they are stripping the buying power of Americans. When you have an insecure border where people are flooding across and they're providing debit cards and they're using taxpayer dollars to facilitate these people into big cities, suppressing the labor market, you are creating economic conditions where there is extremely limited supply with tremendous demand, making housing unaffordable for the average person, especially the younger voters, which is no surprise why they're leaning towards Donald Trump. When they're when they're when they when they say we're going to create, you know, however, they, however, they end up doing this. Right. People need to understand that they don't take your tax dollars to fund war. They create money upon the issuance of debt. So they they just they create a debt, spend the money. And that means these corporations and say Ukraine, where the money is spent in the creation of weapons, paying personnel and PMCs that gets spent back in the United States. And this suppresses the buying power of the average American citizen, drives prices up. You combine that with a porous southern border, and it is almost like they are intentionally destroying this country. I hope Gen Z wakes up fast enough to realize it, to do something about it come November. One of those amazing parts of this bill is that in the in Israel section, it actually goes out of its way to specifically exempt the appropriations to Israel from congressional oversight. It's, it specifically <laughs> allows the Secretary of State, when he approves some of these you know, transmissions of armaments and stuff to simply bypass ordinary congressional notification requirements. Say what you will about Ukraine funding. I've been a huge skeptic and critic of it from the beginning, but they actually have been coerced into at least nominally implementing some oversight mechanisms like an inspector general and other um, IGs that have been part of this like consortium to s at least do some oversight. The funding but with Israel, Congress just falls over itself to say, do what you want with this money. We're not even going to check anything. It's actually pretty amazing. The total vote count on this bill, 70 to 29, actually undercounts the extent to which there is a consensus on this issue, meaning a consensus behind just a never-ending disbursement of these war expenditures into conflict zones, Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, um, because you had a set, uh, at least a, 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 a couple of Republican senators who are some of the most ardent interventionists in the entire Senate, like Lindsey Graham, Marco Rubio, Rick Scott, Tim Scott, they voted actually no, not because they oppose the underlying substance of the bill. They're all staunch supporters of funding Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. They probably even wanted more of it, frankly, if they had their way. It's because they're still making a political point or a procedural point about the lack of prioritization of the southern border aspect, but in voting no, you'll notice it didn't actually hinder passage of the bill. So it's a perfect situation for them politically. They can technically register their supposed discontent with the passage of the bill absent some border provision, but their preferred policy still gets 
put into place anyway. Do you think they take turns doing that? Like they're like, this yeah. time I'm going to vote no. Let's just make sure it gets passed. I'm going to say no on this one. Though next time you get to say no, I'll make sure it gets passed. That way we I both look like a good guy. Oh, for sure, do yeah, they? they, they do definitely that. do yeah, that. Yeah, they have. That's what their conference is about. It's to coordinate and structure their voting patterns. Like, so if somebody needs for political reasons to vote no, even if they support the underlying policy, they can ensure that there's like a trade-off where somebody's voting yes for it. So it's like canceled out and it's going to pass anyway. Because th those people I all mentioned, they all firmly were in favor of this bill passing on a substantive level that they just felt they had to make an ancillary is that, is that, point. Is that the bill and the votes for it? Yeah, this is the vote total if you want to see it. Yeah, how can I pull that up? I want to pull up the source. Um, I tweeted earlier, so you can look at my account or I'll send it to you. I will pull up your Twitter. Yeah, it's How from, long ago did you tweet it? It's from 1.15 p.m. today. 1.15 p.m. today. Let's pull up this. Uh, okay, here we go. This is it right here? Yeah. So these are the yeas. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, no, this that, is a different That's an one. older one. That's an older one. Go to 1.15. That was me replying to somebody and proving them proving them embarrassingly wrong because I pulled up one from 2022. Keep going. Keep going down. Keep going, going down? down? Keep going down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going there. That this one? Yeah. Okay, here we go. The uh, this is Michael Tracy tweeting, the huge Ukraine-Israel bill got 70 votes, which they can hardly ever get for anything. And several voting nay are huge interventionists who only voted nay for political reasons. Yeah, so this is a really good point. Knowing it wouldn't impede passage. That's right. the key point. So, uh... Some people are pointing out, too, because I think it was... Um, like, Lindsey Graham didn't have an epiphany and now opposes funding Ukraine. It was uh, uh, Mullen, I think, who had been reported. And I could be wrong, but I saw a report that he was uh, uh, he had been discussing a discharge resolution. I looked into that. I'm not sure how well sourced that was. That seemed like a rumor. I mean, it's possible, but he actually voted right. no on the final bill. He voted no, and a lot of people are saying that voting no was the right move. But he's being accused, and again, this may be unwarranted, of only voting no because he knew it passed. And yeah. so he'd score political points by claiming he opposed it when he really was. That might be true because he did vote I or yay in on a uh, on a procedural vote like a day or two ago that led to this final vote early this God, morning. So just insidious. I mean, it's why we vote as citizens on in one day. So we don't know what the vote tally is when we go in. We're not supposed to know ahead of time. If I can get 700 more votes, my guy will get it over the edge. You just go and you vote for what you believe. That's, That's the yeah. idea. Yeah. That's, I don't think that's ever been the case, though. I think, you know, <laughs> practice versus theory. But, so Steve Daines, Daines from Montana. Was that a no or yeah? Votes. It was a nay vote. So he's the chair of the Senate Republican Campaign Committee, which is basically the campaign apparatus for the Senate Republicans. So he's very involved in the political maneuverings around individual states, Senate races. And he was objecting, he was uh, justifying his no vote on the basis of, wanting to ensure that Republicans who are running in contested Senate seats this year can still say that, you know, they're against the bill in principle because it didn't do the border component. So he was outlining the political rationale. And it's the same for like a, a Tim Scott. I mean, Tim Scott ran for president, right, from South Carolina. And go back and look at some of the debates. He would give these fulsome declarations in favor of, oh, there's a roach in front of me. Or no, yeah. that's a stink bug. Okay, stink bug. Either way. Yeah. Chinese big difference. I'll, I'll chill out. The it marmorated stink bug. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a big difference. Whenever I go anywhere, I'm just surrounded by stink bugs. Maybe I have to look inward to see the reason for mm -hmm. that. No, that's not true. Um, so I want to I clarify something, these though. But so, uh, Tim, Tim Scott would give these like soaring oratories in favor of Ukraine funding and Israel funding, et cetera. Uh, but now he's voting no. Why? Because he's sort of he's, he and several others of these people who voted no are like a bridge to Trump within the Senate Republican caucus. Trump is, is at least nominally opposed to the bill. And so they're kind of trying to, you know, play this game where they're weighing different political considerations and trying to come to a happy medium that is to put most to the advantage of Senate Republican candidates in November. I want, I want to clarify something, too, because we have a super chat from Brett Tesdall. He says, keep in mind, the Senate bill contains a provision that should Trump be elected president. And he attempts to stop spending the money on Ukraine. It'll trigger immediate impeachment of Trump. That is not That's correct. That's not true. <laughs> what what uh, J.D. Vance was saying is that the bill funds Ukraine into the Trump administration, uh, into the first fiscal year of a Trump administration. And should Trump try to stop the funding in negotiations to end the war, it would warrant or give Democrats uh, 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 a, a reason to impeach. That is, the funding goes until September, I think, 25th. Imagine Donald Trump gets elected. And in February, he says, we're ending this war now. Now, I made the prediction that and it's not necessarily a prediction, but more of like a point that the day the news comes in, Donald Trump will be your next president. He is president elect. The war stops. There's immediate ceasefire because Ukraine knows their funding's done and Russia knows Trump is going to negotiate and it's going to clean everything up 
and, and Putin's not going to want to go up against Trump on the issue. Trump would get on the phone as soon as he's president and say, we're ending this. What needs to be done? Ukraine would lose territory. Russia would end up effectively winning what they wanted, but it would end the war. I think with this bill that nullifies that pseudo prediction, because now funding is secured through September. And if Donald Trump stops the spending that was congressionally approved, they will argue, as they did in the first impeachment, the president has no authority to halt a spending that was congressionally approved. But if that, that means that Donald Trump will not be able to say to Vladimir Putin, the U.S. will no longer fund Ukraine in this conflict. We want an end to the war. Putin will say, you have no authority. Congress has already approved the funding and you can't stop it. They'll impeach you. I saw what happened. It is completely undermining our ability to to negotiate in, in, in regards to this. Could they still fund Ukraine in sort of a reconstructive effort with that money and still end the war? And still send the bills. Well, that funding mechanism is one of several that's used to arm Ukraine. So that one that you're talking about pre-existed the 2022 invasion. And as you mentioned, was in effect when Trump was in office. Right. So Trump or any president would be, in a sense, bound by whatever Congress decides to appropriate to that particular authority. But that's only a minority of the overall Ukraine funding, which uses a variety of different authorities. There's definitely no automatic impeachment trigger. And I'm not sure how much it would really hamstring Trump, because I even I doubt that even if there was some ideal negotiation that he came up with, that it would involve 100 percent cutting off all funding to Ukraine. I mean, you would probably want to still keep Ukraine within the American orbit. You're still basically subsidizing their entire military. Right. Trump has never on principle come out against all Ukraine funding. He actually increased right. funding. He gave him weapons. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. He he uh, <clears throat> acceded to the lobbying of Lindsey Graham and John McCain in 2017 and of Poroshenko, the previous president of Ukraine, and started for the first time setting Javelin missiles. And then when the war started in 2022, Trump would go on like Sean Handy's show and brag how many of his Javelin missiles were being used to kill Russian soldiers. So this idea that Trump is just going to, you know, magically end the war, I think that's a lot of wishful thinking. He won't give any specifics about what he's actually going to do on a policy level. All he says is, the war never would have started if I was in power, which is unprovable, counterfactual. And number two, the war will end in 24 hours because I'll just get everybody to agree and start loving each other. I don't know. I don't know that I, that's necessarily I, I, I don't a realistic agree. proposition. I, I don't agree with uh, uh, counterfactual. I suppose you can argue we don't necessarily know what. It's definitionally counterfactual. It didn't ha it's an alternate timeline. Right. My point is the crisis in Ukraine had been bubbling up under, under Obama. And under the, Trump. The ousting of Yanukovych, Both. but it ended. No, not at all. So I'm uh, so in 2013, Euromaidan protests erupt. The right. conflict between the trade agreement with Ukraine, either EU or the, the loss of the trade agreement with Russia, the ultimate ousting in 2014 of Yanukovych and the riots and separatist movement. Yeah. By the time Trump had become president and I returned to Ukraine, going back to Kiev, it had simmered down to the point where the locals said, we don't call this civil war. No, it's mostly done. There's just some fighting in the east now. So under Obama, dramatic escalation, civil war to the point where journalists were kidnapped by Russian separatist forces. Several two years later, Trump is president. I go back to Kiev. Eh, everything seems to be fine now. We don't really talk about it because it's over. This is what I'm told by well, locals. There was low Kiev. grade fighting in the Donbass, still. but it mostly weakened in 2014. It was terrifying. But Trump fighting. fueled the combat by sending lethal weaponry for the first time and for whatever reason I mean, that was denounced by the kremlin when it happened and, and they said there was it was going to make it more likely waited, to precipitate war which they was correct and they waited until trump was out of office and then under biden we get this massive explosion of war and conflict a resurgence of troops in the middle east i do not think i, I think it is fair to say that if you look at the actions of the trump administration in terms of no new wars timelines for removal of troops from the middle east trying to get our troops out of syria despite being lied to and abraham accord as well as other attempts at peace negotiations, the likelihood, be it 51% or otherwise, is that there would likely not be war in Ukraine if Donald Trump was president. He also did give an indication of what he would do in a, when he spoke to um, Maria Bartiromo in July. And he said, you know, you, you could say that this is vague, which it is, but he said, I would tell Zelensky no more. You've got to make a deal. I would tell Putin if you don't make a deal, we're going to give them a lot. We're going to give them more than ever we got. Ever right, so he threatened, to give, he threatened to give yeah, Ukraine so more weapons than ever before. Right, so what he said was that he would stop all funding to Ukraine if Ukraine didn't make a deal and increase it 
if Russia wouldn't come right, to the table. Right, which is just so, basically saying right. he's going to negotiate with them. But that was his plan. And that's I, what, I, that's I, the I, most I that think, he has said but there about is, his But there, there really is plan. huge continuity, and I've done pretty in-depth research reporting on this. There is hu- a huge amount of continuity between the Trump administration and the Biden administration in terms of Ukraine policy in particular, not on every foreign policy issue. We can get into you know that if you want separately. But in terms of Ukraine policy, it, there's a huge amount of continuity. I'll just give you one very uh, important example. In uh, early 2020, Mike Pompeo, who was then the Secretary of State in the Trump administration, went to Ukraine, met with Zelensky and Ukrainian leadership, and they uh, agreed upon what was the initial uh, iteration of this new strategic partnership that was going to be become operational bilaterally between the U.S. and Ukraine. So they were going to start a new uh there were going to be new parameters to the relationship where it was going to be enhanced bilateral military ties and support and uh, pr- provision of technology and arms and so forth. So it basically increasing the extent to which U- Ukraine was becoming a bastion of U.S. military power. That was Pompeo. And then in November 2021, three or, t- you know, three or so months before the war started in February, the following February, Blinken... Pompeo's successor as Secretary of State go, also goes to Ukraine and codifies that strategic partnership agreement, which, among other things, uh, locks in a U.S. commitment that Ukraine will ultimately formally join NATO. So that was state, you know, reiterated by Pompeo in 2020, reiterated by uh, Blinken in 2021, per, and that's per, a core grievance perhaps, of Putin in launching the invasion. A per, lot of perhaps, it occurred under the Trump administration. Perhaps Tucker should have asked Vladimir Putin specifically on the issue of Trump and Biden. Thanks for watching this clip from the Timcast IRL podcast. Hang out with us live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. and become a member over at Timcast.com for uncensored members-only shows exclusive. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all next time.